Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to have you all here. Um, we're going to be talking about the Linux System Roles project, and I think we will start out by introducing ourselves. My name is David Lehman. I'm an associate manager at Red Hat. Um, I focus on storage management um, uh, for the platform. Um, before that, I was an engineer, and I worked on Anaconda, the OS installer, for um, many, many years. Shirley? Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Hi, so I'm Shirley Ratko. Uh, I'm from the Tel Aviv office, Israel. Um, I'm working at Red Hat. Uh, I've been at Red Hat for the past six years. Um, I'm a senior BI software engineer working on the Ovid project and also on the Linux system roles. So let's go over what we're going to discuss today a little bit. Um, so we're going to give you an overview of what Linux system roles are. Um, we're going to introduce you to two new roles we've been working on, uh, the storage role and the logging role. And we're going to show you a quick demo of uh, how it actually works. Okay, so I think many of us have been here before sitting pretty with some cool automation scripts and then something changes in the operating system and uh, not so cool all of a sudden. Um, new releases with new features and new configuration tooling have a tendency to break management scripts. So some examples of this, uh, do you remember when Linux transitioned from system 5 init to system D, all the heartache that happened then? Um, how about going from manually editing uh, system 5 network configuration files to going to network manager? Um, more recently, we switched from IP tables to using firewall D. Um, the list goes on and on. Uh, but the common theme is that things are changing and it's breaking people's automation. Um, you know, sometimes in the thick of it, it's hard to remember that these changes could also be thought of as progress or as technological advancement. Um, because they present a, you know, not only a real, but an ongoing problem for systems management. So, we set out to try to improve the situation somewhat, and one thing that became clear right away is, um, the thing that's changing is not the what, it's the how. So we realized that we're still doing all the same tasks, right? We're setting up services, we're configuring network interfaces, firewall rules, so on and so forth. Um, the thing that's changing is the tooling that's used by the operating system to manage these configurations. So we realized that what we want here is to a big piece of getting past this problem is a way to express the configuration such that it conveys the essential the essentials of the configuration itself without getting bogged down with the details of the implementation that's being currently used by the OS. So another way to say that in more common software terminology is that we wanted to abstract away the implementation so that the user can just express the important part that, you know, the, the pieces that transcend the uh, current tooling of the operating system. Okay, uh, so for what David uh, mentioned, we've uh, developed the Linux system roles. So what are the Linux system roles? They are a collection of Ansible roles and models. How many of you are familiar with Ansible? Wow, nice, nice. So I think at least one is not, so let's quickly go over what Ansible is. Um, Ansible is an open source automation platform. It's very simple uh, to set up, but very powerful. Uh, it's composed of an engine and a YAML files um, that um, you can create your recipes uh, and just call out the models from that engine. 
Uh, it helps with configuration management, application deployment, tasks automation. And like I said, you can just create a recipe and deploy it on top of your uh, environment um, across flavors of Linux like CentOS, Fedora, and RHEL, and on multiple uh, hosts and get to your de desired state of the machine. Uh, it does not use an agent on the remote hosts uh, like Puppet or Ceph. So the Linux system rules. What we did is basically created an consistent configuration interface for RHEL, Fedora, and CentOS, like an, a, an API, basically. So you don't need to be, we created an abstraction layer uh, from the implementation. Uh, so you don't need to be bothered by the tooling underneath. You just need to, to uh, your configuration will be the same, even if the underlying um, the technology changes. It's maintained by the subject matter experts, um, experts in networking, storage, and so on. And it evolves with the subsystems, so even in the future, if we are changing the technology underneath your configuration and uh, across um, updates, your configuration will stay the same. This is the intention. It's compatible and tested in RHEL 6, 7, and 8, and also in Fedora. Currently, we have several roles that are already released and tested, um, like the network, um, SC Linux, TimeSync, PostFX, KDAMP, and there are also um, roles that are uh, we've also started working on or planning to work on, like the storage, for example, which is supposed to be released in RHEL 8, uh, the logging role, which is still in development, and other additional roles for image builder, uh, cockpit, Sapana, and so on. Okay, so now we're going to dig in a little bit to some of the details of two of the emerging roles. We're going to start out talking about the storage role. Um, all right, so the first thing that I think everybody thinks about when they think about storage is complexity. Um, and this is unfortunate because we're not all trying to optimize something to get um, the absolute maximum number of uh, IOPs or whatever. Um, the truth is that for most of us, storage management should be pretty simple because most of us have pretty pedestrian needs. We want to create a couple of volumes, put a file system on there, and set it up to be mounted, and that's it. So when we set out to do the storage role, the overarching principle or goal was to simplify local storage configuration for the vast majority of cases. Um, so within that goal, there were several other principles that um, sort of building blocks or pillars, if you will. So the first one is that if you're going to make things easier on people, you have to provide a nice concise way for them to express or define the configuration um, that they would like to see on their system. Um, a minimum of boilerplate and um, you know just as little typing as possible. So the next thing is, which is something that helps us achieve the first thing, is to provide reasonable defaults when that's possible. So for example, um, the default volume type is going to be LVM. The default file system type is going to be XFS. Um, that may change in the future, but the interface is going to remain the same. So for example, who knows, in Fedora 35, the default volume manager may be Stratus. Um, but that won't change the interface of the system role for storage. So. The next thing is that we wanted to handle non-essential details automatically. So partition allocation is a perfect example of this. If you're creating an LVM volume, you shouldn't have to know how partition allocation works. You shouldn't have to specify uh, a disk label type, a partition table type, flags, start sector, end sector, none of that. Um, all that's taken care of for you. If you want to create an LVM volume group, you tell us what disks to use, we do the rest. Um, lastly, we wanted to, as much as possible, we wanted to use existing logic to do the heavy lifting. There's already storage management APIs that have been tested and used for years. 
Um, one of those is Blivit. It's a Python module that's been used for storage configuration during the OS installation phase since Fedora 11. It was split out into its own package um, in Fedora 18, so it's been tested quite a bit, and that's what we're using to do the heavy lifting here. All right, so now we're going to do a couple of examples. Um, the first example is, I think, as simple as it gets. Um, what we're talking about here is just throwing a file system on, a, on an unpartitioned disk and then setting it up um, it, to be mount, mounting it and then also setting it up to get mounted on boot. Um, and you'll see here that there is a list called storage volumes. You put an item in the list, you set the type to disk, you specify a disk, you specify a mount point, and then you can optionally specify the file system, but it's going to default to XFS, so if that's strictly optional. And that's it. That's all you have to do. And when that's over with, you'll have your file system will be created, and you'll have an uh, FS tab entry, and you'll be ready to go. Okay, the next example is a little more complicated. This is an example creating a, what we're calling a pool, but in this example, what that translates to is an LVM volume group, and we're gonna use that volume group to store the data for a MongoDB installation. And so there's two volumes we wanna have here, one's for data and one's for logs. So again, we're creating, what we're doing here is we're adding an item into the storage pools list. There's just two lists, there's storage volumes and storage pools. Volumes are for volumes that are not in a pool, and that means disks. So we put an item in the pools list, we give it a name. We don't have to say that it's type LVM, but we can if we want to. Um, we say which disks to use, and then we create a list of the volumes in that pool. First one is data. You can see, again, we're commenting out the defaults here just for hopefully a visual aid. Really, you can see that all you need to define a volume is a name, amount point, and a size. And then second one, similarly simple. Okay, so then one more example. And this is just gonna show some other options that are available to you. Um, Again, we're creating a pool, and we are creating a, one volume in that pool, and we're just showing that you can specify a file system label. You can also specify options to make a FES, and you can spot, specify options to mount, and those mount options are obviously going to go into Etsy FS tab as well. So that should hopefully cover um, a good bit beyond um, the, the absolute simplest of use cases. Um, let's see. All right, so now I'll give you a little bit of a feel for where we are and where we're going. Um, the current status of the project is that we just released um, version 1.0.0 this week. It was released to Galaxy on Thursday, and it's currently in testing um, in preparation to be released in an update of RHEL 8. We're hoping it will hit Fedora 32 as well. And the support there is for the whole disk example that I showed you. You can also do a whole disk with a partition that spans the whole disk. And the purpose of that is if you have a multi-OS situation, that partition table will signal to non-Linux operating systems, don't clobber this thing. There's something, somebody put something here. And then the last one is LVM. Now we don't support yet, we don't have support for um, thin provisioned LVM or cache volumes or RAID or anything like that, but all that stuff is in the pipeline, it's just not in version 1.0. Okay, so um, the roadmap, this is, the order of this is kind of arbitrary. This is subject to um, change. But obviously we're going to want to add um, support for block device encryption using Lux and software RAID, the advanced LVM functionality like thin provisioning, cache, and LVM RAID. And we're going to want to add support for compression and deduplication using VDO, and we're going to want to add support for Stratus, and all that stuff can be added without changing the interface. Uh, another thing that's good about this roadmap is that the underlying library, Blivit, already supports all but, I think, two of these things. So the amount of work is really limited to just the work in the role itself to plumb through to the underlying library. Um, so that means that it should be, this roadmap should get 
traversed quickly compared to if we had to implement our own storage library, that is. All right, so the next slide here is some challenging but possibly high value features that are maybe or maybe not at risk. Some things that seem like they would be really useful for a lot of users, but there's a possibility that they're not going to fit within the constraints of, of an Ansible role. Um, and when I say that, I'm talking about um, some of the principles of Ansible are that things should be item potent, meaning if you run it twice, you should get the same result. Um, and at least I'm not totally sure about this, but I think things are supposed to be deterministic as well. Um, I think that kind of is a part of the first one. Um, and so there's a, we're not totally, we haven't worked out the details of how we can make these work, but um, we have varying levels of optimism for varying, uh, for the various features here. So um, I'll spare you the suspense here. Um, so automatic device names, you know, a lot of the time you don't care what your logical volume is called, right? You just care about the file system and the mount point. So it seems like we could make things even easier for people. You could go from having to specify three pieces of information to just having to specify two. Um, another one, automatic size, is if you're creating a pool and you only put one volume in the pool, it stands to reason that you could make that volume occupy the whole pool if, if the user doesn't say otherwise, right? So that's another one that could be good, but I'm not sure if it's going to work or not. Um, again, automatic disk selection, same deal. You can go out and list the disks in the system and you can figure out which ones have something on them and you can use the ones that don't have anything on them. Um, the last one here is, I think, possibly the most useful of the bunch, and also the one that I'm the most optimistic about, and that's percentage-based sizes. Um, I've been thinking about this the last few days, and I think it's going to work. Um, in fact, I, I implemented it the other day. Um, and this is like a, you can, if you have a pool, and that pool could be either a partition drive or it could be a volume group. If you have multiple volumes within that pool, it might be nice if you don't know the exact size of the drive, it might be nice to be able to specify the sizes of the volumes as percentages of the total size of the pool. And so um, I think it's looking pretty good for that. I, honestly, I don't think that's a risk for, for item potence at all. So, um, you know, uh, pending uh, review and all that kind of stuff, we'll see how it goes. But I think that one's going to be good. Um, and that's really it for the logging role. Um, so thanks, guys. And Shirley's going to tell you now all about the logging role. Hi, again. Um, OK, so logging role. Um, like we said, we intend to give a high level architecture and sort of an API. Um, in the, log, uh, the Linux system role. So for the logging, we mean it's pretty basic. What we want to do is to collect logs from different um, targets, locations, and then ship them uh, to different destinations. Um, we want to make the configuration as simple as possible and to be able to spread them across our system um, to the multiple hosts that we have. Um, so um, we want to collect multiple logs to multiple destinations and apply default settings when we can. As the base of the logging role, we used OSYSLOG. OSYSLOG uh, has been in RHEL uh, since RHEL 6. It's almost 10 years now. And it's become the basic uh, default tool for uh, RHEL, for logging. Um, it, it, it allows us uh, multi-threading, secure connection, diverse destinations uh, that it supports. It can filter any part of the syslog message, uh, fully configurable output format, and it's very it's suitable for class relay chains. Uh, by the way, we did try other um, collectors, but um, at least for now, this one is the one that we feel the most comfortable with in, in regards for performance. Um, so when you run the login role by default, um, just like this, what you'll get is that the role itself will make sure that you have the latest package of RCS log. It will deploy the RCS log config, the uh, default 
Secret One, which collects journal records and send them to files, or based on their the the, the application that send them. And uh, for example, for Varlog messages, for Varlog cron, and based on their severity. For example, if you have urgent uh, um, logs, then you'll get notification if you have logged in users. So this is the default. Um, Another use case that is already implemented is uh, if you already have your own OSYSLO configuration file and you want to spread it across your uh, environment, you, you are able to use the custom uh, files. Here you have in the variables, you have a logging outputs var, um, which is a list of the outputs you want to configure. Uh, in this case, uh, there is the custom files, and you simply need to state where the, your file is located and it will be um, uh, deployed all across your system. Another interesting use case is being able to ship your OSIS log data uh, to Elasticsearch. This is already implemented, so we have an output to Elasticsearch, um, both with certificates or without. Uh, so you can send your journal information to Elasticsearch and have your own um, uh, one source of uh, logs uh, to ship everything in, and you'll be able to get your um, platform to dig into your log and uh, see what's going on. How you will do that? This is an example. So again, we have the logging outputs. In this case, the type will be Elasticsearch. Uh, you will need, or simply need to state where is your Elasticsearch instance, what is the index you want to ship it to in Elasticsearch. If you have certificates, you can state where they are. Um, and uh, you will mention which logs you want to collect. In this case, journal. Um, we are already using the OSIS log role in production in OVET, uh, which is the virtualization management um, system. So we are shipping it. Uh, it. We are using it for both shipping metrics and logs to Elasticsearch. So. For metrics, we are using CollectD, and we added a plugin that sets the, sends the um, metrics in syslog format to our syslog uh, by TCP. And we are also collecting the, the Ovid application logs, and we are sending them to Elasticsearch. This gives us a full monitor solution. Um, it provides us a way to visualize everything with Kibana um, and, cre and creating um, pre-built dashboards, for example, and alerting. We are also going another step in our uh, next release uh, and creating a UI based on the Linux system roles and, um, and everything. So we will have the option to select the host list um, that we want to deploy our syslog and collect Dion. And then this in the underlying um, in the underlying infrastructure will create the vars for the Linux system for the role and uh, simply run it and all of the hosts that we've selected will be will be uh, configured to send the logs to Elasticsearch. And this is the result. You'll get uh, the Kibana dashboard. Uh, you'll be able to drill down to your logs and uh, do the analysis there. So the status of the logging role. The logging role is still in, in development. It's still missing some of the features that we are planning to add. Um, currently, we support, like I said, the default RCS log config, um, the sending the journal to Elasticsearch, deploying custom configurations, and it's already used by Ovid. But on the roadmap, we are planning to add profile-based configuration. Um, so we have the general use case, but we, all, uh, we also want to add additional profiles uh, for uh, resilience and security. Um, we want to add additional inputs. Um, 
this is something that we are still uh, thinking about. We are not sure what will be uh, the additional inputs, and if you can think of uh, good use cases, and uh, then we will appreciate it. If you go in to the project and create an RFP, uh, this will certainly help. Um, and additional outputs, currently the, uh, we plan to add remote RCS log and the uh, remote message buses like Kafka and MQP. And now it's demo time. Okay, so this is a demo that was put together. It's going to use several of the system roles to configure a system. Um, it's going to configure some of the firewall, some network interfaces, um, time sync, and it's also going to set the system up um, to run um, the uh, cockpit web client and composer, the uh, image builder. So um, the beginning here, this is not live. Um, the beginning here, this is just going through some of this, is showing that you have to have several of the systems, a couple of packages installed. You have to have several of the system roles installed via Galaxy. Those are some of the prerequisites. And so then we're just going through, these are the top level variables for the file. And um, basically this is, these variables are to set up um, a couple of network interfaces and set up time sync. And as you see there, the um, the way this is, playbook is structured is that the the time sync role is in, in, uh, invoked up there directly, and the other roles are done as tasks. And it does two things: one is it allows us to control the order of execution, and the other one is that if one of the earlier roles slash tasks fails, it won't try to keep going. So that one right there is going to install um, the cockpit web console, nice and simple. Um, the next one is going to set up the firewall for cockpit. Again, hopefully that's um, the, the language there looks concise. Um, so then next thing is to set up a volume for image builder to use. So it's going to create, uh, using the storage role, it's going to create a pool with a single volume in it. And uh, it's going to set that up to mount it at uh, Varlib Lorax Composer. And that's all based on the, you know, it's conditionalized if you wanted to skip that for some reason. Um, so the next thing we're going to do here is set up the image builder GUI. Again, I think that looks like less typing than other alternatives. And so then this is just an example down here of setting up a, using the networking role to set up a bonded network interface. Um, I'm going to level with you. I don't really know the technical details of setting up a bonded network interface. Um, I was an RHC for rel 5. It's been a while. I think the interesting part is you're not doing it by name, you're doing it by Mac address. Yes. Exactly. And then, of course, the, the other thing is that this is going to run on rel 6 or rel 7 or rel 8 or rel 25. Or you know Fedora 32. We recently added by uh, CI plus security names are the best. So then it's setting up the components of the bond down there. All 
right, so then here, um, this is just showing the initial, oh, I'm hitting and missing this mic, aren't I? Um, this is showing the initial network uh, interfaces. You can see that there's two extras there that are not configured, not being used. And so then I think that the next step here is going to be to um, run the role, or run the playbook, rather, and then sort of uh, verify the results. OK, setting up the time sync, configuring that. Setting up cockpit. Setting up its firewall. Okay, that's doing the storage. Now that's done. Setting the mounts. And then it's setting up image builder. And setting up the bonded interface, and that's it. And you can see that uh, succeeded. Six of those plays changed things. And now you can see they're gonna the bonded network interface is gonna show up. What's next? I think. Oh, okay, this is the image builder services running. Will be verified here. And then you can see among all the other file systems, you can see the new one we created for image builder composer. And to get a little bit more of a detailed view on that, um, here's a look at the LVM setup. The last one there is the one we just created. And incidentally, um, there are already fixes written. They're not in the tr they're not upstream yet, but there are fixes that you can see there. He chose to make the um, volume 19.5 gigs. That's because of the metadata used by LVM. So if you just would try to, to run an LV create with 20 gigs, it would not work because the disk is 20 gigs and there's metadata usage. So I've got a fix in my local tree that I've tested that will um, just trim the, the requested size as needed in that case. And then, of course, the percentage-based sizes will solve it even more elegantly, I would say. So um, that's that. OK, so this is the way you can get the roles from Galaxy. You simply need to call them. Um, here are the links to the landing page, documentation, GitHub repo. Um, we encourage you to go if you are an expert in your field and you want to contribute, um, that will be great. And if you want to try it out, some of the roles are already in Galaxy, some of them under, uh, are under GitHub repo. Um, give it a try, please. Um, and tell us what you need, what other features you need. Um, and we'll try to integrate them in. Uh, any questions? Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my name is Alex. First off, let me thank you for the work that you've done as a sysadmin. I appreciate it a lot. It's going to help us a lot in our future projects. And the first question is, does it currently support non-Red Hat Linux systems? That's a good question, and I think you could, I could, I could either um, be slimy and say that's unknown, or I could say no. Um, I don't think that we've put any effort toward uh, running it on Debian or Ubuntu yet. 
Yeah. Thank you. Um, are there any plans to convert this to a Red Hat supported product? Because, uh, you know, all of us probably knows that Puppet got the equivalent, say, uh, which is Puppet Enterprise, where they encourage all the other software developers, communities, even proprietary um, companies to develop the Puppet models and, you know, make them used. Uh, great question, thank you. Uh, my name is Terry and I'm on the RHEL product management team. So um, they do all the wonderful work, so uh, thank all of you. But um, but yeah, I can answer that question. So yes, they are supported today. Um, so they're, they're in Galaxy as the Linux system rolls, uh, so you can install them that way. They are shipped, uh, Michael DePaolo here with us uh, does the Fedora packaging, so he packages those up as a Fedora RPM uh, called Linux System Rules. In, in RHEL, uh, they are in the Extras repository for RHEL 7, and they are in RHEL 8 AppStream repository as the RHEL System Rules. And so Galaxy is the native, Ansible native way of getting them, and that's going to match GitHub, so kind of like the latest, greatest upstream as they add new functionality. And then as we test it, and uh, document it and you know do all of the CI testing against it um, we will ship them as part of the rel system rules package so fully supported um, and so we will fully support that um, ansible is a little bit tricky we make the ansible engine accessible with your rel subscription so that it's easy to get to and we have so many layered products that depend on it now but if you want full broad ansible support you still need to buy an ansible engine engine uh, subscription, but we support this as like our user contract, if you will, because we need to make RHEL consistently uh, configurable as you move from RHEL 6 to RHEL 7 to RHEL 8 and beyond. So like we owe that to you. So we're we're committed to supporting that for free. Uh, yes, that's, that's one of our friends who planted the seed for this uh, project. So thank you. Um, so that's a long-winded answer. I hope that helps. Thank you, Terry. So as somebody who's done Ansible for a long time, one of the things that often frustrated me is as my code got more and more complicated, I couldn't refactor it because I'm in YAML and not in Python. And the underlying mechanism for all this stuff is Python. Has there been any thought of taking, now that you got it working, and taking what you've got working and making it into Ansible modules and, and perhaps even clearing, cleaning up the internal object model within Ansible so that those are reusable components so that, for example, I don't have to go across the wire for each call, right, because that really does slow down. I have to do an SSH call for each individual module task. I also have to um, maintain state inside of Ansible. If you look at your playbooks that you were, you're specifying for these there, you have global variable names, which as a longtime programmer makes me wince. I know that that's the tool that you have to work with. That's what Ansible puts in here. But if they were Ansible modules, then they would be explicitly namespaced by those modules. Has there been any thought? And I, as I get, I understand you got something working. This is the this is the reason why Ansible is so successful. So you can share your code this way. But the next step is to make this stuff maintainable. Is is there any effort going to be going into moving it to the right abstraction level, which is the, uh, the Ansible module, not roles for these? I know it's, I shouldn't be asking this question as something on the sales side, but I have to. Um, so I think it varies from role to role what the architecture is actually. Um, I initially implemented the storage role using pure Ansible using the existing Ansible modules that are out there. But like you described, the YAML became a nightmare and I got to the point where the next thing was block device encryption and I was just like, I would rather quit my job than even try this in YAML. So. Um, 
because in storage, right, there's arbitrary stacking of the different layers, and, and the animal just is not equipped to deal with that. Um, so what I did was then I refactored everything into a Python module. Um, so really, if you were to look at the tasks, the main tasks file for the storage role, there's almost not, like, there's like this really embarrassing thing where I spent 200 lines um, filling in default values in some dictionaries because I don't know YAML very well. And then there's one module call to a, bliv a module called Blivit. And then there's another one more call to a, a mount, the mount module, and that's it. So I don't know if that's standard practice, but I think that to a large extent, I know that the, the networking module looks like that, or the networking role is similar. So we did think about that. I don't know. It's probably not perfect, but we thought about it. Um, thank you for this, and I really appreciate the fact that you've got it connected to Red Hat virtualization. That's very cool. Um, the thing about storage, though, is it's really scary to get right, and it's really easy to screw stuff up. And from what I saw here today was, hey, whatever's in the playbook just happens. If I find a disk there, I just write all over it. Is there any sort of safety in there that says, ooh, there's already a file system there, or, oh, by the way, it's already mounted somewhere? That, that um, protects me against doing stupid stuff? Well, so, f for example, if there is already a file system there that is of the of the same type, I think it's just going to get used. Um, there, storage is, it's funny because I agree with you that storage is scary, but I, I don't agree about how a storage is scary. I don't think it's scary that when I push go, it goes. But what I do think is terrifying is all the different permutations of how things can be, right? Like, I can say, create me an XFS file system on SDA and mount it at foo, and then when I go to look at it in Ansible, there may be a, an XFS file system on SDA, but it may not be mounted at foo. There may be one already there, and it's mounted at foo, but it's got the wrong stuff on it. There could be one, you know, like the possibilities of what you have to manage are incredibly complex, and um, to the, for the most part, you're going to get what you ask for. Um, so if you, for example, if you have some, if you have an LVM stack on VDC, and then you tell us to create a file system on VDC, we're going to wipe it off before we do that. Um, and you know that's the thing is everybody likes to put the safety buttons in storage, right? Are you sure? But you can't do that with automation because it's no longer automated. So I would love to have a gentler response to that, but I don't know what it would be. Um, so to kind of follow up on that, actually, um, a similar question I had to give a concrete example that concerned me. Um, you commented on having defaults for, say, the file system or the volume manager, um, and that can change. Oh, is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, my bad. Uh, should I just start from the beginning again? Um, yeah, that'd be nice. I'm having trouble with mine, too, so don't feel bad. Okay. Yeah, my bad. Um, so to, to give a concrete example to what he um, just brought up, um, that I, um, so with storage, you commented on having defaults for, say, the file system or the volume manager or something like that. And there's, of course, the possibility that, that could change, which is fine. But um, let's say I, I run this on a system, um, I upgrade, and then I run it again, and the file system's changed. What happens? Do you, like, do you rewrite my disk, or what happens there? That's an excellent question. If you have the, um, if it's already set, this, that's kind of our problem to solve. If the thing is already set up and it already has the same mount point, then we're going to assume that it's what it needs to be. Um, what we'll have to do, we don't have it there right now because the default hasn't changed yet, but what we'll just have to do is add an additional layer of logic that says, it'll differentiate between you said LVM or you didn't say anything. You know what I mean? It will be just a little more gentle if you didn't say anything. We'll know to be a little more flexible in, in using what we found. Okay, thanks. I'm glad you thought of that. I'm, 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 yeah, I mean, you know, I, we don't know completely till we get there, but um, we'll work it out. Move the mouse. What? Oh, the screen went to sleep. Okay. Hi. Okay. Hi. Uh, like my colleague here, I want to congratulate you on this effort as well. Much appreciated. Um, Thank you. I have many questions, but I'll go to most glaring for me. Uh, is, is there a plan to incorporate uh, iSCSI or other uh, uh, block over wire 
or even NFS uh, uh, or other networking file systems into the storage role, or is there like a different uh, storage role that uh, is dedicated to this this uh, kind of technology? Well, I'm, I'm suspicious of you now because there is, as it happens, there is <laughs> a um, uh, sort of an in development, uh, a pretty nice prototype out there that is specific to remote storage. Um, and we have talked about, we haven't worked out the details, but we have considered dedicating this role to local storage and then having a dedicated remote storage role that can manage those sorts of things. Right. Thank you. Thank you.